Hey everyone and welcome to Freightonomics, where we combine uh, the transportation and logistics sector with the macroeconomic environment uh, to provide you with Anthony Smith. I mean, <laughs> to provide you with the most comprehensive view of logistics and transportation and how it fits within that macroeconomic climate uh, so that you can go about your day feeling more informed and more intelligent about what you do or maybe just about what we do. <laughs> and that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> it all comes full circle. Yeah, welcome back to Freightnomics. I'm Anthony Smith, lead economist here at Freightwaves. I'm here with Zach Strickland, the Sultan himself, Director of Freight Market Intelligence, and this is Freightnomics. Zach just introed it, but Zach, this is a special show today. Special show. We're, we're changing things up. We're changing the game, rewriting history. Or no, we're not rewriting history. We're just changing the future by giving you an hour of Freightonomics uh, every week. And also, we've moved the show to Thursday. That's right. Because That's right. hump day was too crowded. <laughs> <laughs> no, to Thursday's at noon now. So welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, you know, it's it's been a wild week, too. I'm kind of glad that we moved it to Thursday this weekend. Yeah. I mean, we've got a lot of topical stories to cover, but also we have the illustrious Zach Rogers on a little bit later in the show to give us some updates and discuss some topical things as well. Uh, you know, Anthony, let's get right to it. Let's do it. I'm also watching socials right now. So oh. if you're on LinkedIn, comment and join in on the conversation. If you're watching on a Thursday at 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, we're watching now. Yeah, let's get right to it. So we've introduced some new segments into the podcast here. Now, for those of you that are watching on TV, hopefully you are, uh, for the sake of what we're about to do. But the, uh, for those that aren't watching, you know, you can check this out on FreightWaves TV. Uh, and it, obviously go to FreightWaves.com and look for Freightonomics to find that or download the app uh, so you can watch the show whenever you feel like. Uh, but we're starting a segment called Memonomics here because they are so fantastically fun for us. <laughs> <laughs> to, to view. I obviously love memes. Anthony does not because he is not a good person, but I They're forced overrated. this on him. Uh, anyway, uh, let's start off with the first one. This is, of course, very topical uh, with the I saw a millionaire today. This is fantastic. This is fantastic because one of the themes of our show today, of course, prices of commodities. Right. And Anthony, you've been talking about this uh, lumber prices. Mm hmm. All time highs. Yes. <laughs> like nobody yes. can go uh, get lumber. It's, you know, the housing sector, of course, has been booming. But of course, everybody that's been sitting at their house has been spending all this money on this wood. And the meme, for those of you that are listening on your headsets here, uh, <laughs> a, a, tr a truck that's hauling a trailer full of two by fours <laughs> down the street. And it says, I saw a millionaire today. Uh, extremely relevant uh, Did to you what's just say going listening on. on headsets. <laughs> headsets. Is that what the kids are calling? No. It Zach, that is not what the kids are calling it, and I love that meme. I don't like memes, but I love that meme. Okay, as long as we're, we're clear. <laughs> and I got another one. Uh, it's same type of uh, you know topic here. Take me somewhere expensive, and you've got a couple eating a fine, <laughs> what's like a delicious dinner. I mean, I would yes. love to see if this was at Lowe's or Home Depot or, or some that other building store. backdrop is to die for. Yeah, the backdrop is full of plywood and, of course, lumber. Take me somewhere expensive. These, this couple is obviously dressed. They're uh, doing it right. To I mean, <laughs> when you're looking at, I'm wondering, because we've all been wondering, how long is this going to last? And it's, it's my job, I guess, technically, to kind of look at like how long this shortage would last, essentially. Right. I'm thinking it's going to be a thing all the way until the end of 2021, at least to the, throughout the second half of 2021, going into the fourth quarter, for sure. But I love the memes, how instant they are, because like, I have a library of memes on my phone, mm -hmm. and I can kind of tell what was going on in that moment in time based off like those groups of memes. It's like a good <laughs> calendar of events that were happening. Well, you, you know, you, there's all these ancient, like these old school memes that are mm -hmm. from like 2011. <laughs> the style changes quick. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can, and a lot of those are still relevant today, though. So I don't, I don't diss the past now. This next meme, of course, extremely topical and relevant. Uh, for those of you who have been living under a rock, you may not know that there has been a bit of a, a trouble with the Colonial Pipeline. This pipeline, of course, has been uh, shut down thanks to a cyber, where, uh, cyber attack, ransom <laughs> attack, uh, and it services a big chunk of the nation's uh, fuel supply, diesel and gas. And, of course, everybody that gets news of this, uh, you know, you get on your your face spaces and your tweeters 
uh, and you talk about how there's no <laughs> gas at your local gas, gas warehouse uh, or gas station, and you go out and you fill up uh, a week before you need to. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. Leaning in, I'm leaning into my, uh, my age here uh, <laughs> a little bit. But yeah, you go out and you fill up and you create a gas shortage. Uh, congratulations. Self-fulfilling prophecy, I mean, yeah. essentially. Congratulations. Like, this is, shortage, let's make a shortage. You know, the, it reminds me of, you know, every time that you watch one of those movies and you've got this evil government that won't tell the population about, you know, some sort of pending catastrophe. Mm -hmm. We are proving them right. <laughs> <laughs> every time that something like this happens, we are proving, the, we were making the case for the, the big, large government entity, the CIA, the NSA, whatever you want to call it. Whoever's keeping the secrets, keep the secrets. And yeah, don't tell us. We'll <laughs> react poorly. We are not capable of handling uh, the potential for something to go wrong in our lives. So we obviously need to go out and get toilet paper. We were talking about this the other day. Gas is the new toilet paper. Yeah, it's like uh, this herd mentality, <laughs> essentially. And I looked at my gas tank. I'm like, you know what? Well, I have the luxury of being able to walk to work, so that helps as well. Nice. But I'm like, you know, I'll let it hit E. I'll just wait it out. I'm sure I might be able to get a good deal, I mean, in a week or two. It's no, I, I legitimately had one day of gas left in the tank this morning, and I told you, I was like, listen, man, Friday may not happen. I got you today, but Friday may not happen if things continue because the entire, the entire way to work all bagged up gas. Uh, everywhere. Zach, you were part of the problem. I was, and I, I, well, I found a gas station that had gas this morning, and I made it just in time, didn't I? I'm glad you did. Yeah. They right. didn't have gas last night, but they had it this morning, so I was able to get it. So it's, you know, this is that herd mentality situation. This is why commodity prices, mm -hmm. we see the same patterns. We are humans as a, a, a person as smart people, not so much. Um, <laughs> you know, because we have to react this way, because what if it's like a situation like myself where, you may not, you may be capable as a human yeah. of showing restraint, making those rational decisions. We see this in commodities. We see this in business uh, where you, you think, okay, if we just don't react and act like everything is normal and fine, everything will be fine. But then if somebody else, you know, say a percentage of your group doesn't do that, you, you, you're forced into that situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We see it in shipping. Uh, a lot of the shipping behaviors that we see nowadays, and you know, we make fun with the uh, with the memes, and of course, people hoarding gas, uh, filling up containers and bags. <laughs> uh, I, I think Nick Austin actually said he saw people with grocery bags of gas. I hope not. Um, Concerning. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, you know, but it's reality. Like these are things that you have to be cognizant of. So we saw as they're getting capacity on the ships. You know, mm -hmm. shipping from Asia to the North America's uh, coasts, it's what drives up prices. Right. We see prices in gas. We see prices in container shipping. We saw it uh, last year. Once one uh, report of, you know, well, we don't have any containers mm -hmm. gets out. Well, we need to go ahead and jump in and try to get as many containers as possible now because we won't be able to get them three months from now. Yeah. And that's what's happened in, in the last year has been like, you know, among the pandemic and everything. And of course, uh, COVID gave us reason to do a lot of this stuff, but that's the way, that's the world we live in. Yeah, that's human everything nature. is pent up, everything is instant, everything is a herd mentality. Mm -hmm. And and social media too is, a, is an active part in all of that equation. So you, you know, even though you may be a rational human capable of restraint, you have to acknowledge that there's a lot, it only takes a few irrational humans or people that are simply thinking like us. We got to, we got to, plan for the potential that things aren't going to be available. Yeah, and I think that kind of leads into economics as a whole. There are times where you think people, so like, like in economics, you look at models and this is going to shift this way because consumers are going to react this way. Sometimes consumers just act irrational. These models are only good if you're thinking that someone's going to act in a rational way. Yeah. And that's where all these unintended consequences come out from economic policies. I know we're talking about an event here, but it's just economic policies happen, all these unintended consequences are sure to follow. And you think people are going to be logical? Think again. Yeah, you can only build the model so logically until it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's get to our next segment, Newsonomics. This is, this is a perfect segue uh, from those memes into our first story of the day. Of course, the Colonial Pipeline has reopened as of last night. Yep. So the Colonial Pipeline 
operator came back online about 5 p.m. yesterday, Eastern Time, uh, said it's going to, you know, take a, you know several days before they're back to full capacity. They've they had a few of these uh, gas lines off the main line, you know, operating, but the main one was not pumping as uh, until about 5 p.m. yesterday. It services uh, Texas to New Jersey. Uh, if you've seen the map, go check out John Kingston's articles on FreightWaves.com. He has several of them out uh, right now. It largely impacts the southeastern corridor of the United States, Atlanta market. Uh, if you're in freight, that is a huge hub of freight activity. So the concern here is that how does this impact diesel? We see the gas, you know, the retail gas itself, gasoline for the cars has had a dramatic impact. <laughs> you know, you can't find gas in a lot of areas of the southeast. Um, but diesel... A little bit more buffered. Yeah. Uh, truck drivers and trucking companies do act a little bit more rationally. Uh, it's hard to panic buy uh, when you have a 53 foot trailer attached to your to the back end, and you got to be somewhere in eight hours <laughs> on the dot. So, not necessarily as big of an issue for diesel, but there are some scattered reports of diesel outages, and of course, this freight market that we have been in has been not very well suited for any kind of disruption whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about the winter weather event back in February. We still haven't come out of that. Right. Uh, you know, tender rejection rates still above 24% as of today. Uh, tender volumes still about on par with where they were, you know, roughly a month to the, a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. you know, in March when uh, demand was still super elevated. So any kind of disruption, you know, uh, if a truck driver can't fill up his tank, Today, that puts him off schedule by a full day. Yeah, now he's, there's a whole... Or maybe he's got to drive 50 miles out of route yeah. <laughs> to go get and, and fill it up. So if this does occur, and we won't see this right now, but it may become apparent next week as some of these network disruptions, if at all. Uh, we haven't seen any data to support that it's having a dramatic effect just yet, but the southeastern corridor is already super tight and primed for this. Yeah, and it's one of those things where we're already very stressed in the supply chain, and this is just going to add a whole other variable of, hey, how can we make this a little bit tighter? <laughs> you know, drivers, you know, switching in and out, left and right, you know, the supply chain is just constraint. Just throw fuel in there in the mix. Let's just add a little spark in there. Who had gas shortage for, yeah. for May uh, in 2021. For good measure. The pipeline services 45% of the East Coast fuel supply of gasoline and, and diesel and, and the other distillates there. Uh, thanks to a, and this is, this is the fun part, the, the criminal gang uh, known as Dark Side. <laughs> For you DC fans out there, uh, they're not, it's not spelled the same way, but <laughs> uh, evil group. I mean, it, it's almost kind of comical in a way, yeah. Dark Side. We're <laughs> the yeah. evil criminal gang. Oh man, I just, my whole inbox is just going to be raided. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have no words for dark side. <laughs> dark side just wrecked my bank account as we speak. Uh, so there we go. Uh, yeah, so gas shortage, we're going to wait and see what that does to the freight market. If anything, uh, obviously consumers, they're out spending money on gas as well. So <laughs> uh, that means also that they may not be spending as much money on your consumer goods. Maybe your little feelings index that you have uh, might get a little hit. This month. We'll talk about those feelings. We'll talk <laughs> about those feelings. I mean, I mean, we can, we can, we're not fast forwarding. I didn't even plan on talking about this, but you bring up a good point. The home purchasing sentiment index came out, it dipped down a little bit. And so, for those of you who might know, home purchasing sentiment index put out by Fannie Mae. And essentially, what it looks at is a bunch of components that really kind of break out what are the factors that are going to be considered for someone to buy a home, you know, whether they think it's a good time to buy a house, sell a house. They feel confident in their job prospects in the coming months. If they think that um, their their salary is going to go up in the next you know couple of, uh, coming months, next twelve months or so, it moved down because one of or the lowest reading in the history of the index ten year history was good time to sell or to buy a home. People think it's just awful. Like buyers want to buy, but they can't buy a home. So that part of the index huh. took it down. And that just shows that people are, especially between 50,000 to 100,000, that um, income range, household income range, they have cash because they have been receiving um, those stimulus checks. Those saving rates are at, I wouldn't say historical highs, but they're still pretty high. And they have been saving for homes, um, those that have been able to kind of retain their employment. And so they have this cash to spend. They want to buy a house, but they can't buy a house because the inventory is so tight. 
O tight, and of course those wood prices are extremely high. Yes. So yes. maybe they, they, you know, they're sitting on some money, uh, but inflation getting in the way a little bit, and also of obviously the inventory level, and it takes a while to build a house. But it does. Moving on to the next story, uh, this comes from the Wall Street Journal. Now this is pretty top, uh, relevant in terms of what the big storylines have been over the last two years. Tariffs drive drop in Chinese imports. Now this is something we've been waiting on. You know, the pandemic kind of put this on the back burner for a minute in terms of the trade war and, and the relations with China. Chinese imports surged during the pandemic because there was no time for anybody to really adjust. Well, now we're finding that, you know, countries like Vietnam and other places in Asia have seen a dramatic increase in uh, sourcing. So mm -hmm. a lot of suppliers sourcing a lot more freight out of uh, Vietnam now. You can see here on our sonar chart, uh, the customs import shipments, that blue line there, that's Vietnam. And again, this is on a dual axis chart. Chinese imports still dwarf. If you look over there on the other axis with the orange line, 21,000 uh, imports uh, last week from China compared to about you know, 2,800. <laughs> yeah. Still, still not uh, on the same exact wavelength there. But the point being is that, uh, you know, especially here over the last month, we've seen a dramatic rise in imports coming from Vietnam. So shippers are starting to get back to what they were trying to do before, which was, you know, kind of reshore, not necessarily nearshoring. The article does a good job of saying that this nearshoring idea that everybody's been talking about and we've talked about as becoming a uh, growing possibility over the coming years. Have, that would have a dramatic impact to freight uh, in the United States, hasn't really materialized, especially in the data yet. Of course, it's much easier to resource from a country like Vietnam than it is, say, Mexico or yeah. Canada just yet. It takes a little bit more time. Yeah, and this kind of adds into something we're going to touch on here soon, and that's going to be around further talks around inflation and commodities and things like that and the strain for goods being purchased. I mean, when you're looking at our largest trading partners, China's going to be in that mix. And if we are reducing our trades with China, that's fewer goods really coming in just because of sheer volume right. coming into our, our borders. And so that's going to put a strain on the amount of goods just kind of being dispersed. That's going to rate, put, up, put upward pressure on prices because there's going to be essentially less stuff, more demand, increase in prices. Yeah, I think that's, that's a little bit of a trade-off here. Now, I, I don't know if we're going to see, you know, Vietnam is, it, it's, doesn't necessarily have the dramatic infrastructure that have, China no, has. They no. don't have the ability to replace China by any means. So this is obviously, you know, it's an interesting trend to watch. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this tells us that companies are looking for alternatives, which I think is really the biggest story here is that companies want to de-risk their supply chains at this point uh, and find alternative uh, sourcing areas in China and Vietnam, obviously, is probably the first place that I would expect it. Vietnam, Southeast Asia, other areas uh, of that, you know, region, uh, India as well, sort of the easiest places to transition a lot of your sourcing and your, and your goods. So uh, really where that materializes for, you know, freight and stuff is how the freight comes into the country, which ports of entry, which points of entry, et cetera. Uh, so certainly something we saw in the trade war with more East Coast volume coming through. And we're already seeing that right now, but except it's more like everywhere all at yeah. once. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next big topic of the week, the stock market has been on a free fall. <laughs> now, um, and this, this is, you know, obviously, we've talked about inflation becoming a problem. The headline here, Wall Street Journal yet again, uh, global stock market's down, uh, you know, on inflationary concerns. Um, and in this, they highlight, you know, some of the goods and services that are seeing some price increases uh, inside of there. So it's, you know, we talked about inflation being a concern on the producer price index, a lot of the internal like, goods, like it's only a matter of time before that mm -hmm. CPI yeah. uh, comes, comes into play. The consumer prices, they start paying for it. Um, and That's of course, here. the financial sector is, you know, they're not terrible at economics. No. <laughs> so they understand that there is the potential and we have to, you know, take this for what it is because the financial sector looks, you know, probably somewhere in the six to 12 month horizon. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are a lot more nearsighted than others, but six to 12 month horizon, this doesn't look great. You know, they were really quick to respond to the pandemic, but they were also very quick to kind of set their expectations a little bit higher. 
mm -hmm. uh, as they saw some of this consumer demand. So this is a little concerning uh, yeah. for the later half of the year when we're talking about inflationary pressure. Some of the things that they highlight is showing some of the strongest increases in price uh, in April. Airline fares, number one. That one, no kidding. We don't have the capacity that we had before the pandemic. This is kind of like, this is right in line with the next one, admissions to sporting events. These don't concern me, Anthony Smith, because these are, we still have restrictions on crowds and, and availability. This is a supply side issue that will correct itself in the long run. Um, and they're, it's really just a matter of there not being enough supply here. And so sporting events will open up, mm. you know, their capacity as obviously this demand will support it. Uh, and air, airlines will, of course, bring their planes back on. Uh, the ones that do concern me a little bit are the ones that are more durable, like the televisions. People are still buying televisions. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, as we're starting to exit, like this pandemic, computers and televisions showing increases is concerning because these are things that are a little bit more mainstream. There's not a good way for us to, you know, overcome this in the long run. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Does that, I mean, how do you feel about the kind of this bottom of the list here where we are seeing, you know, not necessarily the services, but some of these durable goods show up on this list as big rate increases? I mean, so one of the things before getting to the bottom of the list is that used cars and trucks. So I want your opinion on this, Zach. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at used cars and trucks, we also saw a run up in cryptocurrency and game stock, or game uh, stop stock. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Reddit. There's a lot of people <laughs> that made bank and benefited from this. Do you think there's going to be a certain area of high end sports cars or exotic cars that get purchased by those who won with crypto or game stock or these other stocks that came up um, throughout the pandemic? make these purchases, tighten up the market for those exotic or high-end sports cars, but don't quite have the reoccurring income to maintain these vehicles. And now we see like this glut of exotic sports cars that we're not be able to maintain like two, three years from now. That is a fascinating uh, point that you're making. And it's not just going to be sports cars. It's going to be everything. It's going to be everything. It's going to be everything. <laughs> also, do you think there's going to be a, a soon I don't know, glut of cars in general on the road that are maybe broken down because people were rushing to the gas station <laughs> and they were just filling up with anything they could get their hands on and putting like E85 in a non-comparable or like diesel. Oh, man. Or putting, you know, low grade when they needed high grades. I'm wondering. All right, take off your tinfoil hat. I'm um, just saying. You gotta <laughs> gotta <but> look. <laughs> I do like your point about some of this financial sector stuff. Uh, when you're talking about people taking their gains out of the market, they've been sitting around, you know, a lot of day trading, mm -hmm. uh, people, you know, playing Dogecoin, which has got no inherent value whatsoever, but is just basically this market sentiment, you know, gas pump gouging yeah. type, uh, you know, short run situation. If this isn't your career, you're not going to be sitting holding on to these gains. You're going to sell and, and cash out soon. I, I don't like short term spikes for the economic environment. You know that, Anthony. It makes it very unstable and very volatile. It's fun for me to watch. I don't like to live in it, however. Yeah. <laughs> so it's definitely gonna be something to watch as we do. We are gonna see ripple effects from this COVID pandemic lifestyle for years to come. No doubt about that. These are gonna make year-over-year -year comps some sort of nightmare for oh, they any, already are. any financial like analyst retail sales out there. Stuff like that. I mean, I can't imagine being on, you know, reporting my numbers to the boards over the next couple of years. It's It would be awful. So. Last story before we dive into Zach Rogers and, and get some of his wonderful insights. Uh, this just kind of, you know, we already know, we're kind of confirming. Uh, Kim Linkwills writes an article on FreightWaves.com. Uh, on ongoing cargo boom drives Port of Long Beach's record April. They smashed <laughs> the, uh, the, all, the record by 118,000 TEUs, the ports of uh, Port of Long Beach. I mean, this is... This is already the nation's largest port conglomerate in Los Angeles, Long Beach. Um, and they just dr destroyed. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. It's like, it's not like this is a small port. No. This is the largest and it grew by that much. And so yeah. that's saying something when it's one of the most busiest places in the country. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is this again, fuel to the fire. If you are moving freight in the United States, this is just a lot of more energy uh, sitting there, ready to be moved at any given time. Still inventory levels are low. 
this summer is going to be crazy. And I don't, and Henry Byers, of course, is saying that it's going to be a crazy year yeah. in, in general. So that being said, we're going to start a new uh, segment here uh, before we get into Zach's uh, LMI indexes. Let's uh, let's talk about what anomics. What onomics? What I think onomics. we need so, like sounds and we do need sounds. We're going to get sounds for that. I kind of sprung this on a last minute, effect. but this is going to be where we dive into about a five good minutes of a specific statistic or variable or something that we find fascinating that tells you exactly uh, all you need to know about this specific specific statistic. And today's statistic, I'm going to run it because it's freight. <laughs> Let's hear it is the outbound tender rejection index. So obviously a lot of people that watch freight waves know what the outbound tender rejection or, uh, you know, as we call it, OTRI, uh, is in general, but its purpose is to provide a way for people to uh, understand what's going on with truckload capacity and trucking capacity in the, in the uh, trucking market in the United States. So tender rejection indexes, if we pull up the chart uh, to show the seasonal tender rejection index for the United States, this is an index that measures the rate at which carriers are rejecting electronic tenders from shippers. The higher this rate goes, the tighter the market is and the higher rate that you pay for transportation. Uh, tender rejection rates, of course, are uh, you know, divided into 135 markets uh, in the Sonar platform, but the significance of this index, and especially over the last several years, is that it is very objective. It is not measuring network functions. It is not measuring uh, necessarily shipper relationships uh, and things of that nature all at once. It's simply measuring, is your truck available at that contracted price on that day? And of course, the higher it goes, if it's over 20%, generally, historically speaking, over 15%, this is uh, considered a very tight market. Yeah. Uh, in the COVID pandemic era, we reached 20%, stayed above that level for nearly uh, 10 months at this point uh, or longer. Uh, as we approach uh, year over year, we do expect it to stay that high. Now, if you look in years past, a historically normal or well-supplied market, if you want to call it that, is right around 5 to 6%. That is a loose market. So uh, when you're talking about tender rejection rates below uh, 7 8%, that is a more stable environment. Shippers tend to get better rates. Carriers tend to have lower options. They don't necessarily have a lot of availability to, you know, a lot of ways to get out of certain areas. Uh, and so lower rates persist. And we see a lot of trucking failures in that five to 6% range, nationally right. speaking. And this works well on any given market that you're looking in. So tender rejection rates, Nice fundamental data point to look at, to look at a very objective point of view for truckload capacity in the United States. So the thing I love about it, so would you, first off, would you say it's more on the supply side or demand side? Uh, it's both. Ooh. So if you look at tender rejections, it is the end result of the equation of supply demand. Uh, that's why it's so great because right. you don't have to know the supply side, which is extremely opaque. Uh, in the trucking industry. Uh, the demand side, it's less opaque, but it's still hard to find, you know, if you are in the right positions uh, sitting throughout the country. We have seen demand increase and tender rejection rates come down. And that's because trucks are positioned in better places. Right. They're where the freight is. So tender rejection rate is a great end result of the equation. You may not have to show your work <laughs> on your economic supply demand curve to get the end result, but that's the point. You already have the answer. And so also, they have the thing I love about the OTRI, the Outbound Tender Rejection Index, is that it has great correlations with other indices and they line up perfectly. One of those indices being the Logistics Managers Index. And who better to talk about the LMI than Zach Rogers himself? Zach Rogers, welcome to the show. Hey guys, the big one hour, a yeah. big show. You asked for it, so we gave it to you. <laughs> Specifically, <laughs> Zach Rogers asked for it. <laughs> That's right. Well, Zach, yeah, you guys welcome are, you so guys much. You put me in a seven-minute box, and it just it wasn't working. For no, me. no, we needed to beef it up. <laughs> and welcome back. I know you. You just got back from Vegas. Must be nice. Just got back from Vegas. <laughs> Thank you. For... Yeah, my mother-in-law's house in the suburbs was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he wants us to think. Yeah, exactly. Mother-in-law in Vegas. I've heard that story before, Zach. 
No thanks. Time and time again. <laughs> <laughs> but Zach, we were talking about the outbound tender rejection index, and we had to bring in, of course, mm -hmm. the LMI. We have the latest reading from the LMI showing a 74.5 second highest reading in the history. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So it's the second highest rating we've had in the five years we've been doing this and in the highest rating in, yeah, I don't know, three or so years. So it's it's a lot hotter now uh, than it has been in a long time. And I, I sent you guys some pictures um, and, uh, you know, the, the first ones I think we were going to talk about, right, was capacity. Right. Um, and, and really, really what we're seeing here is a tension between capacity and price. Um the big, you know, the reason we're up so high right now, the reason that we have the LMI up so high is because we have we hit a record high in warehousing price and we hit a record high in inventory costs. So it's never been uh, a faster rate of growth, essentially, in terms of, uh, you know, warehousing and inventory. And it's interesting because like with warehousing, you know, it was a, a, an 83.5. And that's coming on the tail of an 81, a 79, a lot of mid high 70s. You know, normally warehousing prices are growing somewhere in the, I don't know, low 60s, something like that. And it's related exactly to this graph you, you guys just put up now, which is warehouse capacity. And just to remind everybody, uh, as we do every, every time I'm here, any number below 50 means contraction. Any number above 50 means expansion. And you can see that warehouse capacity is at a, a 41.8 uh, in, in April. And that's coming on the heels of it being less than 50 all the way back to August. And even in August, it was right at 50. Okay, so really, uh, if you throw out the, the, the two months where it was right at 50, warehouse capacity has been contracting since March. And, and it's interesting because, you know, a lot of the parts of the economy kind of had this, this fallow period, March and April of 2020, and then we slowly started to take up. But warehouses and inventory are different. And the reason for that is because warehouses and inventory is where everything went when we suddenly stopped uh, the world from spinning, basically. So we had all these all this inventory ready to go out into the store then all the stores closed. And so the warehouses were already pretty full, even when the economy was, was slow. And then you might think, okay, well, at least then the warehouses will have some relief when the economy picks back up again. But that wasn't the case, partly because we had so much inventory coming in from all over the place, including overseas. You guys are just talking about the Port of LA up, you know, 170% this week from the same week last year. I mean, it's crazy over there. And we also started having so much more, you know, different kinds of shopping, online shopping, which, you know, you need more warehousing space for. And so basically warehouses haven't had a break. Every other part of the economy essentially had some sort of break at some point in the last year. But warehousing has basically been full speed ahead, you know, gas pedal all the way to the floor since everything shut down last March. And it's still that way right now. And so there's essentially been no relief now for 13 months. And as a result of that, as a result of no relief for 13 months, we're seeing the highest rate of growth in inventory costs and warehousing prices that we've seen in the, in the five years we've been doing this. You know, this is fascinating. If we go back, like the, the first chart that we had up there with the L, comparing the LMI to the OTRI, uh, that I just talked about, like we see a little bit of some retraction in the OTRI here over the last little bit. And just what you said kind of explains why we're seeing a little bit of a divergence in the direction of the overall LMI, because the LMI, of course, measures more than just transportation. It measures uh, right. warehousing and the logistics space. And, and some of those upstream throughputs are very interesting because you're talking about how, you know, we're seeing a little bit of an easing in capacity. It's obviously not dropping tremendously. That's a 24% rejection rate, historically high, et cetera. But it is seeing some easing, uh, you know, in the near term. But a lot of this freight that we we're just talking about, it coming through the ports of Los Angeles, Long Beach, et cetera, is going into these warehouses. And I, th I talk about it like it's potential energy for the freight market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's fascinating to see uh, you know, these warehousing and inventory costs, like now what, at what point, Zach, does, 
do those inventory costs make it necessary for that freight to start moving again? I, I can't imagine that there's a lot of companies out there that are, you know, that just in time mentality yeah. that persists. They, they've got to be thinking, okay, maybe we need to go back to that a little bit as some of these prices are, are getting, a, you know, pretty dramatic, right? Right. Well, it's, and that's the balance between how much you want to pay to hold the inventory and how much you want to pay to move it. And so right now we have people coming up with different solutions uh, depending on what that, you know, what it is. And a lot of it, uh, unfortunately, is dictated by, by the OTRI, right? So there's some companies that would love to be moving things out of the warehouses, but their loads keep getting rejected, you know, every one out of four, especially for the sort of, you know, low margin stuff. Like we see all the problems we're having with uh, timber right now or with agricultural products. Well, if, if I have the option to move, you know, a truck full of phones or something versus a truck full of, of trees, <laughs> the trees are going to stay in the warehouse, basically. And so that's sort of what's happening right now. Now, to your point, it's so hard to go to this JIT model when you have all this demand. And, and that's really, that's really the, the, the big issue right now is that we have crazy demand. Okay. And so every other part of your company is saying, Hey, we got to produce, we got to produce, you know, we'd have this once in a lifetime spike, but then just the supply chain can't move it. And, and honestly, I think a lot of it is, you know, I mean, we've talked a lot of times about how supply chain has never gotten as much attention uh, as it did this year. Like finally people realize like, Oh, Hey, there's a supply chain. Maybe I should worry <laughs> about that. And so I think a lot of the decisions, honestly, Zach are being made in a place that's not supply chain. I think they're being made in the C-suite. And sometimes the folks in the C-suite, whether they come from finance, marketing, whatever, they're looking at one piece of this. They're looking at demand. They're thinking about the bottom line. And, you know, it's sort of like, well, you know, someone's going to take care of this. The, the supply chain fairies will come in and they'll move <laughs> everything around for us magically. And, and we don't have to worry about that. And so I think that's a big piece of this. And maybe now we are getting to the point where Instead of the rest of the company's concerns dictating how we do our supply chain, the supply chain, because it's so expensive, may be dictating what the rest of the company does. So, Zach, one of the things you mentioned was like specifically the strain on the supply chain, one of those being transportation capacity, one of the other indices that you highlight in the LMI, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, <coughs> excuse me, transportation capacity is a 33 right now which is extreme rates of contraction, extreme rates of contraction. And it has been negative going all the way back to last May. So last May, uh, about a year ago, was the last time that we had any growth in the, uh, the trucks that are available. You know, we saw this, this, this month, the orders for class eight trucks actually went down even because we have a historic backlog. We've been ordering, you know, every month over month, we've been, oh, big, you know, near record orders for class eight trucks. And then in April, they actually way slowed down because people are frustrated because it's like, well, I, I ordered a truck in September and that one's not here. So I don't think I'm going to order one in April either. And a lot of it is because of the semiconductor issue. And so we can't get enough trucks on the road. Plus we're having, you know, constraints with drivers, which we always have. Um, but it's, it's really the fact that we can't build enough trucks to catch up with demand. And, and it makes sense. I mean, if you think about it, we don't have a lot of trucks that are just sitting around in normal times, right? You always want to be getting as much use out of your capital assets as, as possible. Well, um, you know, when suddenly uh, the demand for that capital asset jumps up by 45% instead of 15%, maybe like it did last year, we just don't have enough. And so we're trying to catch up as quickly as we can, but we're hitting all of these supply constraints on the other side. And so to dig ourselves out of this hole while having all these these sort of controls and, and issues we have with the semiconductors, it's going to be a while. Uh, it's going to be a while till we catch up. And, and I know I gave you guys a, a future chart, too, that we can talk about in a minute. Our respondents are not optimistic. Uh, they're not optimistic that this is going to change. Uh, when we ask them, hey, next 12 months, where are we going uh, with all this stuff? The number they gave us for, for warehouse capacity is a 53. So some moderate growth. That's that's great. Cool. Some some moderate growth there. Um, and then the the number they gave us for uh 
for transportation capacity is a 44, which is no growth, actually some contraction. And so, oh yeah, good. You guys got it up right there. And so it's basically what, what our respondents are telling us is like, look, we don't think, we don't think there's any way for us to build this up uh, as quickly as we're going to need to over the next 12 months. And so you can see the, the price indices on those all in the mid eighties for inventory, for warehousing and transportation, the inability to get supply to match demand is probably going to keep uh, going to keep prices high for the next uh, next 12 months. Yeah, I think it's interesting to note that the transportation optimism not there. Uh, you know, I, I wrote a chart of the week about, you know, where we are in the cycle of ordering class eight trucks. Um, you know, if you look back historically, there's it's really hard to look at history. Um, I actually did my senior thesis on how history fails you dramatically. Uh, you know, at some point in time, history does not repeat itself um, <laughs> in the way that it it uh, definitely uh, will come up and bite you if you've built models based on certain sections of time, uh, behaviors change, et cetera. But that being said, if we were to look back at the most recent uh, period of where we had a huge amount of truck orders and mm -hmm. capacity was really tight, uh, we didn't have the same you know, shortages of semiconductors and supply chain bottlenecks, but they were backlogged at that point in time. I know I went to, to Daimler and they were talking about how they were on a nine month, nine to 12 month backlog in 2018. Right. So, right. and that was at a period of time where things were normal-ish, <laughs> if you can call it normal. So I, mm -hmm. I, I do see what you're saying and I, I, I think they're spot on in having a lot of pessimism about this resolving itself in the near term. I mean, we're talking about right. they're ordering trucks as fast as they can and in a normal year, six to nine months out, that truck shows up. Then also you're talking about an employment uh, availability being there as well, where people are trying to get jobs. And in 2018, they were still trying to get jobs. Uh, right, right now, we're not. Is there any, are you seeing any kind of shift in the employment side of things? I know we talk a lot about the durable goods and all this kind of stuff, but what are you getting from some of your respondents on employment? We, we know we have trouble with the drivers, um, yep. but I'm hearing a lot that this is pervasive uh, throughout all industries. Oh, yeah that employment has it's, become an extreme problem, especially when you're talking about supply chains, trying to get people to work in these warehouses or on these you know, sourcing right. and production uh, side of things. Yeah, it's tight everywhere. It's tight everywhere. So um, you know, one of the issues is, so we had the stimulus, which is great and, and, I, and probably was necessary. Um, and so it put a lot of money in people's pockets before they had a job. And so one of the things that that did, one of the things that that did is it jump started inflation ahead of time. Okay. And so inflation, we just saw it's up, you know, 4%, 4.2%. Wages are stagnant though. And so in some ways, I think some of these com companies need to sort of readjust where wages are relative to inflation, because if inflation is going like this, the cost of everything is going like this and everything else is staying flat. That obviously can be can be an issue. And and if I already have some some stimulus money on top of that, you know, tax day, everybody out there, tax day is this week. Uh, you know, I'm getting my my tax return back. Maybe I'm I don't have as much of a rush to go back, especially to like a you know, kind of warehousing jobs and things like this where the pay tends to be a little bit lower. But you know, we we see tightness all over the place. And I think in many ways, you know, we're gonna have, and we've said this before. We're going to have before COVID and after COVID, you know, BC and AC in some ways when we think about the economy. And I think that the way that we we think about uh, how certain jobs work is going to totally change uh, within the next, uh, you know, well, because of COVID. And I don't think it's going to go back exactly to the way it was. I think the way that people work is going to be a little different, a lot more stuff at home. I think Zach brings up a really good point there of how things are going to shift moving forward. I mean, when we're looking at the employment sector, one of the things I was talking about just the other day was the incentives. Right. So he mentioned people maybe in the warehouse aren't going to be just jumping for joy to get back into the workforce. There are incentives at play here. Now, if you have a take-home salary or household income that's comparable to what you might be getting on these bonus unemployed benefits, you might not be rushing back to the workplace. And I think 
there's gonna be an initial surge of individuals that do wanna go back to the workplace, whether or not they are going to be getting a comparable pay or not. And I think they're gonna be the ones that are gonna be able to win because they're gonna be the ones filling those roles quickly. Right. Now, after those roles get filled, those that kind of sat back and waited may be up against a little bit stiffer competition and a little bit harder employment conditions. Yeah, I think this is an interesting thing to watch. I, I think what he was saying about the wages being stagnant mm -hmm. is a big thing, especially when you're talking about people getting more money with a stimulus package than they were getting before. And, you know, we lost him for a hot minute there, so we're going to let him finish his thought. But, you know, this... It's interesting to see how this all plays out. To me, this feels like a big jumbled mess yeah. in terms of employment. Yeah. Uh, you got people that are still sitting there saying, I'm not ready to go back to work because I'm not gonna make as much money. Once that runs out though, you're gonna have this, in my mind, and I don't know, you guys know more about it than I do, there's gonna be this flood of people that realize, wait, I'm paying 50% more than I was for food before the pandemic, and now I don't have a job. Yeah, so <laughs> I, that's why I think those first initial ones to return back, going to be setting themselves up for a little bit more success and those who might wait a little bit longer to get back in. But talking about prices, we got Zach, Zach, Rod back. Zach Rogers, <laughs> he put together a combined logistics prices mm -hmm. index um, as well. <coughs> That's right. So it's something we've never done before. Sorry about that, by the way. I, I <laughs> Change of location. I know that my charger, my charger wasn't working great. I'm actually going to send the video of this to my IT people. I've been bugging them to get me a new laptop for the last six <laughs> months. So I'm going to send this link to them and be like, look, see what happens. So um, Be prepared to pay more uh, for so it, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm not going to be able to get it because of semiconductors. So um, so basically, we put together a, uh, a chart that we've never done before where we combined the um, price indices for transportation, warehousing and inventory. We put all three of them together. So it's an aggregate measure. Um, as I mentioned, uh, warehousing and, and inventory have never been growing faster than they are this month. And then transportation was a 92, which I think the highest we've ever had for transportation is 95. So it was only off the all-time high by a couple points, and it's still one of the five highest levels we've ever measured. So when you put all of those things together, we came out with uh, a number of, of 260, I think 260.7. Um, and so it's the fastest that all three prices together have ever been growing. And I think it's important for us to think about the supply chain holistically like that. A lot of times, you know, we'll break it up into this one metric or this one metric or these two metrics against each other. But this gives us kind of a composite just on the price side. And, you know, if you're a company, you're not only paying for warehousing, you're paying for transportation and inventory. And so I think this is relevant and it's faster than it's ever been. And I think it's interesting, especially to compare it to last April. You can see that that little dip, you know, that the valley kind of in the graph you're showing here is 159. And so it's literally up the, the three metrics together are up a combined 101 points uh, from this time last April. And, and now, of course, that's last April, the height of shutdown. Zach, a minute ago, you were talking about how crazy it is to look at any year-over-year -year comparisons right, <laughs> right now because they're just so extreme. But I still think it tells a story. And this really explains why we're having the cost problems we are and why we're having the capacity problems we are. I mean, it's, it's a classic bullwhip situation where everything was really fallow a year ago, and now we have record high costs throughout all the supply chain metrics together. I mean, just the, I mean, the year over year on April alone, I mean, April was the pinnacle of the shutdown <laughs> and, and, you're, and you're looking at it and, and it's, yeah, the year over year comps for April are just amazing <laughs> in, in general. So yes. let me ask you this, is this, is this too fast? Are we, are we coming out of things too quickly? I know that sharp falls are generally, you know, followed by sharp rises and vice versa, but mm -hmm. Are, right. we, are we overheating ourselves a little bit here with some bubbles coming out? There's going to be some bubbles in some places. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like you look at real estate prices. I don't know how all of this is, is sustainable. And of course, you'd prefer to come out of it more smoothly. But, you know, a lot of times the, the harder the bounce, the, the, the quicker the rebound. And so we came down so fast. You know, this wasn't... Uh, a recession for anything other than the fact that we had to just close everything down. The fundamentals of the economy were basically fine. I mean, there was some slowness actually in 
the industrial sector, right. which we see coming back now. But in terms of the consumer sector, everything was great in February last year. And now things are, are turning back on again. You know, I think I saw somewhere that this was uh, you know, one of the busiest Mother's Days ever uh, for people traveling and stuff. You know, Mother's Day is not normally a traveling holiday. Uh, but there was a ton. Of, I mean, there was a lot of people in the Las Vegas airport the last weekend, I can tell you, because <laughs> everyone's like, we can finally go outside. What are we going to do? Well, I guess I'll go see my mom. And, and so I, I think that people are just so excited to get out of it. Um, it, I don't know how you could slow it down. Um, and, and maybe you could have been a little more targeted with the stimulus. Um, I, I think they did the best that they could and, you know, having to do it in three weeks or whatever, maybe. Right. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I do think that we're coming back really, really hot. Um, that being said, you know, all the projections are that GDP is going to go up 6% this year. Um, and so maybe if, if that really happens, is 4% inflation the biggest deal in the world? I don't know. The other thing, though, with, with all those projections, it's the same thing we talked about a minute ago. I don't know that all those 6% projections have the capacity in mind. You know, transportation is 8% of the economy, which always, that number always surprises people. <laughs> but it's in an even more important part of the rest of the economy. You know, I mean, transportation in many ways, it's like the, the point guard on a basketball team. You know, it, it's not so much about how many, how many points the point guard scores. It's he's got to get the ball to, 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 to LeBron. You know, he's got to give the ball to all the, the other people. And that's what transportation, the transportation, warehousing, logistics facilitates the rest of the economy. And so we have all these rosy projections saying, oh, the economy is going to come back full force. Well, demand is coming back full force for sure. The ability to meet that demand, though, with logistics specifically, that's where I think you might be right. We may we may have to smooth this out a little bit because I don't know how how we're going to be able to handle the costs. Yeah, it's kind of self-limiting in that way, uh, the way that you can't really produce as fast. It's almost like everybody going out to buy gas all at once uh, yeah, when you're not right. really set up to have everybody buy gas all at once. Well, I got one more, uh, you know question for you here as we're, you know, and this is po post to both of you, uh, economically speaking. So we're coming out of this pandemic white hot. Are we going to see some sort of, is there going to be a sector that does not make it uh, out of this? I mean, I think one of the big stories here is that uh, economy is thriving because everybody's coming back, but there's so much change going on uh, a lot of times that pain creates a lot of energy as people, the economy needs a problem to solve. You know, the PC solved that problem back in the 90s. You know, the iPhone solved it back in the early 2000s. We need problems to solve. And as we're solving those problems, it generates a lot of economic activity. Is there a sector in all this, though, that gets left behind in the economy? Dogecoin. <laughs> Dogecoin. <laughs> Do you know what's know what you got against Doge? Yeah, I I don't have anything against Doge. More power to you. It just it's not it's, it doesn't have anything behind it. Anyway, is there a sector, Anthony Smith? I'm gonna take a bit of an alternate approach. Mm -hmm. I think a sector that's not gonna be solved, but maybe opened up, drugs. I think drugs are when we look at legal policy. I think maybe the legalization of cannabis, marijuana, nationwide. I don't know if that's going to be an issue or an industry that doesn't make it. Maybe that industry just kind of shifts into this newly found legal status. I think that might be an issue that's going to be solved is the legality between not just cannabis, but I'm hearing other drugs kind of being up for debate. We see we Oregon did. So I think that might be a thing in the next year or so. Interesting. Jack Rogers. Well, we lost 12,200 brick and mortar retail stores last year. And I think that piece of it, you know, how people are going to shop, I think there's real lessons we're taking away from all this sh stuff that's shut down. You know, I, I think the move towards more online shopping and, and different types of things, uh, you know, working from home and, and maybe, you know, gyms and all kinds of things like that that died, I think some will come back. Restaurants are certainly seem like they're coming back. Gyms seem like they're coming back. I don't know about malls, um, you know, and, and, and it's been something that's trending downwards for a long time. Literally the only retail store that added any, um, 
any any you know storefronts last year was like Dollar General wow. and uh, and Dollar Tree. And sometimes those can move counter cyclically to the rest of the economy. So, I, you know, I, that's going to be an issue, I think, is we had so many people working in retail and going back to your employment thing. It's the question of, are we going to see the people who were working in, you know, stores in the mall, PacSun, American Eagle, whatever, are we going to see them all shifting to working in an Amazon fulfillment center or are they going to go do something else? And maybe it's delivery stuff, Uber Eats kind of things. I don't know. But we have this whole class of people. I mean, 12,200 stores, that's the part of the economy that's not coming back are those retail stores. And so if you think, okay, well, there's 20 people working at each of those stores, those numbers add up really, really quickly. I mean, we have, you know, there's millions and millions of people work in, in retail. And if that doesn't come back, you need to redistribute uh, all that employment elsewhere in the economy. And to me, that seems like the, the big question that we're going to have to solve in the next couple of years. Yeah, that's definitely going to be a big one. Well, Zach, thank you so much for coming out for our first hour long show. Uh, tremendous yeah. job as usual, but tell everybody where they can get in touch with you and find out more about what you do with the LMI. Right. So we post all the reports uh, and also you can you can uh, sign up to take the survey at the T-H-E dash L-M-I uh, dot com. Outstanding. Well, enjoy your sunny, uh, wonderful weather and cell phone service that you have where you where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's working better than my computer. You know, I'm supposed to give a final in an hour and a half. I don't know how that's going to work, but it's I'll figure bet, that out hopefully before 12. <laughs> I bet you'll I bet you'll pass. I think you'll do fine. Just, just study a little bit yeah, more. This, this could work out for the students, actually, if my computer won't turn on. This might actually be better for them. So, no. Right on, man. Thanks. Cool. So lots of stuff going on right now with the economy. Um, but we're coming to the end of our first hour-long show, and we do have one more segment to cover. Got some debate stuff. Before we say goodbye. Hey, we got, we got a bell. We got a bell. We got a bell. We got some sound in there as well. Debatonomics. We like to finish every show with a debate when we have time. And now with an hour long show, we certainly have that. So Anthony Smith, my question that I posed to you today, Jason Statham just came out with a new movie. Jason Statham is an action star mm -hmm. and he just goes around and kicks everybody's tail mm -hmm. and all the time. Liam Neeson, also an action star. Yes. Who are you taking? Jason. And why? Jason. Tell me why. Uh, I feel like with Liam Neeson, he has to exist in a certain world for you to fear him or for him to be actionable. I think Jason Statham, he has the physicality to be the action hero in any kind of world. I think Liam Neeson, you have to believe that he has a certain background and he knows a certain thing and he knows people and he's able to pull off these feats. I'm going with Jason. Well, here's why you're wrong. Jason Statham is a one-trick pony. He comes at you at the same character every single time, karate guy, kicking your butt. That's great. Do what you do best, Jason. But guess what Liam Neeson is? He's a Jedi. <laughs> he's a mad dad. <laughs> mm -hmm. He fights wolves. Uh, the dude, literally, any, any position you put him in, he's coming at you. <laughs> but you have to be coming. existing in that world. Also, I like the one trick pony because it sets my expectations. I love Little Caesars. You know why? I know what I'm going to get every single time. I'm not going to be into a surprise if I go to Little Caesars in New York versus California versus New Mexico. Little Caesars, Little Caesars. I know what I'm going to get. Well, also, ketchup should be in the refrigerator. <laughs> oh, man, that is for another day because I could go <laughs> on for longer than we have. As usual, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and thank you for the, uh, you know, the information on how Jason Statham is inferior to uh, Liam Neeson, Anthony Smith. Thank you to our guest, Zach Rogers. And of course, thank you to, uh, to our audience for watching, listening on however you're doing it. And if you are looking for other ways to view us, obviously download the Freight Waves TV app uh, and on podcast players everywhere. Look up Freightonomics or just look up Freightcast and get every Freight Waves podcast available uh, to you. So, I mean, and I got to do quick shout outs because I, I wanted to get to some of these, uh, in the comments, we had Greg Dubuque, uh, in, in here on LinkedIn. We had Tim Dooner, of course, upset at what, why throw shade at Doge like that with cryptocurrency? Um, John Calloway, which we might even have to, <laughs> cause he bought some Doge. <laughs> do you think it's going to go up after we mention it? We have Evan Korn as well. So we have quite a few people 
uh, to think. We're gonna get back to you all here shortly. Thursdays at noon now. It's not on at 2 p.m. on Wednesdays Eastern time. It's Thursdays at noon.